Hey, welcome to Discovery again. How many excited to be in God's house? Amen. Man, I'm stoked that you are here as well. I know that every week we're getting more and more people that have been joining us online and deciding to like come back little by little still. And so if that's you, man, we're glad that you're in the house today, whether it's your first time or uh, you haven't been back in a while. It's glad. It's, it's awesome to, to see you again in, in the house of God. We've been like throughout this, co one of the benefits of honestly the quarantine and COVID was us going online and really perfecting our reach. We have people joining us, not only all over the city, the state, the country, the world. It's been pretty awesome. Even here, like in our city though, we're seeing that we have large pockets of people tuning in like every week in our biggest pocket Locally here is in Tehachapi. We have so many people watching from Tehachapi, Wasco, Shafter, Delano as well. They're like our highest reaches. So who knows? Maybe Discovery is going to be expanding here. So, so I'm excited that uh, we are in this series, but closing this series, it's bittersweet, man. It really is. How many of you have enjoyed James, the book of James, studying this, you guys? It's been really fun, man. I've enjoyed it a lot. We've been just doing like a verse-by-verse -verse study of this. It's kind of more like of a maturity teaching series where we're digging into the Word of God. It's for those who are in Christ to grow up in Christ, kind of that style of teaching uh, going verse by verse through James. And we've covered a lot of topics. Today's week nine. This is officially the longest series that I have ever done. Uh, I've done an eight week, a couple of eight week series, but today being part nine is officially the longest series that I have ever taught. And we're going to be closing it out in James chapter 5, and he is like, uh, every week, man, there is some truth that James is bringing in a very unique way that is confrontational, the way that he communicates and writes, and so we've been kind of taking that journey together, and today's no different. It's, he, he, he's going to talk to us about, and I'd love to share with you about a controversial topic today. So, so I have a, a, an agenda through teaching today uh, that is uh, very aggressive. Like I, I have a lot I want to cover with you. So we're going to study the last part of James. And within that though, I, I want to study this theology uh, and do some theological study with you about something that James brings up. We're going to study healing today. Is that okay? We study healing today and the theology of healing. And we're going to, it's like not even in your notes. I got so much today. It's not in your notes. I hope you came ready to study the word of God today because we're going to study that. And we're going to make some observations. I want to show you some observations about the text that we're going to be reading. And then James brings up this Old Testament story, an Old Testament character to inspire our faith that we would pray differently. And then we're going to study that together as well as we close out this James teaching uh, together. Amen? Okay, let's jump in. James chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 13 and we're closing out James all the way through the end of chapter 5. He says, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Isn't that, that sounds like good advice, right? Really, real good advice. But how often do we actually, when we're in trouble, do we take that advice and we actually Pray seven times in this section from James chapter 5, verse 13 to the end. Seven times James uses the word pray, pray, pray. I love asking people to pray. Like, like when we're in small groups or just in circles and stuff like that. I'll ask a new believer, man, hey, how about you? How about you pray? Like, oh, me? What? I'm like, yeah, you. you can, let's go. Let's pray. And I've just, I love it because no one teaches people how to, like, it's, it's like, you're not getting taught how to pray, and prayer is honestly just communicating with God. And, and we're told throughout the scriptures, and James is going to harp on us here, like, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, then you need to learn how to talk to Jesus. Amen. Like, you have to. So he says, hey, when you're in trouble, here's a, here's a really good idea. How about you pray? How about talking to God? Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise, which is actually a form of prayer. Praise. So he says, whether you're in trouble or you're, you're, you're in good times, what you should be doing is talking to God. What you should be doing is, is praying. Seven times you're going to see this all throughout this section. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray. There it is again. Pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And we actually do that at the end of every service. If you don't know, we have prayer team members that are up here at the altars. So when everyone goes out that way, like you can actually come this way and be prayed for. And 
And some of them do even have oil. We use oil. So you're like, well, what's the deal with the oil, man? It's not like magic oil. There ain't no magic oil that we have. There's nothing secret in the, in the oil. The oil in the scripture is just a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So, so when oil is used, it's just a method to get you off of focusing on man and focusing on God. Because a lot of times we'll, we'll focus on the person praying and like, oh, I need pastor to pray for me. I need this person to pray for me. Oh, this person is really righteous. Can you pray for me? And God does not want you focusing on the vessel, but on the miracle worker. So, so, so that's why we use oil. So you don't look at the person. You look to what the oil represents. You look to God, the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, the Lord will raise them up. So we're going to study that because that's, that's real controversial. There's a lot of different extremes and thoughts about that. And then he kind of changes the subject. Almost it looks like he like turns the, flips the whole script a little bit. I'll tell you why. But he says, if they have sinned, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. Now that's not, the word there is not just the physical healing word. That's the total healing like the deliverance of soul healing. Here's, what, here's why you need to be in a small group at Discovery Church. Like it's not just another thing for you to do and for you to get connected or study the Bible or do whatever the activities that they are saying they're gonna do signing up. That's just honestly all well, fun, good. Sign up for those things. Do that Bible study if that's attractive to you. But the whole reason why you need to be in a group is because of what James is saying right here is that, when you confess your sins to one another, that there is something that happens in your soul. That there, listen to me guys, there are things that God is, is not going to give you directly. He's actually gonna give you through other people in your life. And the reason why some of you do not have your healing yet, the revelation yet, the understanding yet, the breakthrough yet, is not because your relationship with God needs to improve, it's because you don't have the vulnerability in your community for confession to happen. Ooh, are you hearing me, you guys? So you don't, have, you don't have a community where you're doing what James is saying, where you can be real and honest and breakthrough can happen because God is actually gonna use that person to bring it to you, not to download something to you from heaven. Okay, are you seeing? That's why you need to be in community. That's why you need to be in groups. There are signups out there today. You can do it today. You can go online and do it. But he says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, I don't know about you, you guys, but I, I want like God-sized fruit in my life. I want, God, I, want to, I want to live a God-sized life. I don't want to live a life that I can attain by my own means, my own strength, my own intellect, my own knowledge, my own effort and energy. And some of you that are here today, some of you are living like that, and you're doing pretty good, to be honest. You're doing pretty good by yourself because you're pretty smart, and you can handle a lot, and you got strength, and you got grit, and you got grind in you. But here's what I like to say. Prayer is the difference between the best I can do and the best God can do. Like, so the, di the difference between your effort, like what you're producing by yourself and the God-sized stuff, the difference between that is prayer. And if you want to start seeing greater things in your life, you need to start praying for greater things in your life. And James wants to lift us, lift our prayer and lift our faith to actually believe God for the things that we are actually praying for. So let me give you three observations that I see in this text. And this first one, we're actually going to study a little bit, of, not even in your notes, so take a lot of extra notes today. This first one is important. I think we need to study it. And that's this, that God still heals people. James says, if you, if you confess your sins to one another, hey, the elders will pray for you, someone lay, lay their hands on you, the sick will be well. How many of you believe that God still heals people? Amen? God still, I believe God is still healing. How many of you are here today have experienced God's healing in your life? And in your, can you just lift up your hand and look around, look around at the testimonies of God's healing power. We see it today. We see, like God is still healing. We have testimonies all the time, not only around the world, but even in our fellowship, God is healing. We hear it throughout the altars here. In our, a couple worship nights ago, we had someone come in with a fractured foot and leave with it not fractured. We had someone come in with, without being able to see in one of their eyes and left being able to see with both their eyes. Like we have, one of our leaders here has had a chronic back and shoulder problem for a couple of decades. 
that they were not able to stand for a certain amount of time or run or jump, and it limited them. And, and, and she had a touch from God right here at Discovery, sitting right over here, and she is now able to run and jump and dance and do things she hasn't been able to do for decades. God still heals people. We absolutely believe this, but we need to study this a little bit because there are two extremes here that I see that are dangerous for believers, that, that we need to be careful. We need to think rightly about what God says about healing and what James says about healing. So let me pause for a moment, give you some extra notes for you, extra note takers. What are the extremes of healing? Well, you got one camp called the dispensationalists. Dispensationalists are those who say, well, sure, God used to heal, but he doesn't do it anymore. I mean, and maybe it was, I, I've heard of different reasons. Well, when the Bible was fully complete and written, uh, then we don't need any more miracle signs and wonders because now we have the Bible. Or when the apostles all died, when they, when they died, that's the, the, there's just no more healing that's happening. The, there's only one problem with this viewpoint, this theological viewpoint is it's not in the Bible. It's just not in the Bible. In fact, the Bible says the exact opposite. Hebrews chapter 13, verse eight says, Jesus Christ is what? He's the same. He's the same God then that he is now, yesterday, today, and forever. Listen to me, if God has healed one person in the last 2,000 years, then he's still healing. Amen, somebody? Amen. Some people believe that, that, that the great physician has closed shop. And I'm here to tell you today that the great physician's shop is open and will stay open. Amen? God still heals today. That's an extreme dispensationalist, okay, that God somehow has stopped. And that's dangerous, man. That, that's, that's not the God that we serve, a God that is somehow ripped of his power or his authority or somehow has removed his hand off of the, the work of man on earth, okay? That's just not, that's not true. And then the other extreme, the pendulum swings all the way to the other side to what I call the confessionalist. Confessionalists are those who like the name it and claim it camp, you know what I mean? The, the if I um, blab it, I can grab it. If I speak it, I can receive it. And, and so it's this, this camp of like, well, I, if, I, if I believe hard enough and I speak that faith in my life, then I should be able to receive it. But then when we, it doesn't happen, if it doesn't happen and you believe for it and you, and, you, and you spoke it, then something must be wrong with you. There's some sin in your life. There's something wrong in your life. And what this does, this, this theological worldview about healing, it leaves people very wounded and very disappointed and very discouraged. There is a spirit of condemnation that comes with this because it's just not true. God does not move that way all the time because I think a lot of times our prayers are so earth focused. We, all of our prayers are like about the things going on on this earth, but you do know that God does not live on this. Like God exists in a different realm. Like he's, we're praying all about like what this earth and help me out with this and help me out with that and God, is trying to get us focused on, on something else and something bigger. God's, listen, his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And so when we pray for something here on earth and we don't get the answer we thought we should get, I believe most of the time when we don't get the answer we thought we should get, that the answer to our prayers is actually heaven. That we thought, oh God, fix this. And God's like, yeah, I'm gonna. I got a plan for that. I'm gonna fix it in heaven. No, no, I'm gonna take care of that. Don't, I am. And we're, because it's not fitting in our earth life, we think that somehow God is not working things out. And, and we're just not, look, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not, God is, I can tell you this though, God is always good and does what is good. See, I can trust in God. And listen, you're not gonna walk this walk of faith if you don't, if you can't trust that God is good. If, if you cannot trust that, that he's working, if you, if you gotta get a comfort level in the things that you don't understand. It's, there's gonna be some things that you can't or won't understand and you gotta get comfortable with that if you're gonna walk this walk of faith. But then the question is like, but why does, but why? Why doesn't it happen then? Because the Bible tells us to pray and that people will be healed and like, and like and especially in the season we're in right now, we're losing loved ones and people are dying and they're faithful and they're good people and we're praying for them. And so why? I, I don't get it. Listen to me. And I think this is why James is saying, pray and increase your faith. Pray and increase your faith because obedience is your responsibility and the outcome is God's. So see, my responsibility is to pray and believe. God's responsibility is the healing. 
And he gets to choose whether that comes now or later. But this is important. I want to just pause on this for a moment and give you a few, a few thoughts because you guys are, there's, there's these extreme worldviews or, or theological views about healing that are out there. And I know you guys are reading books. You guys are listening to podcasts. You're watching these sermons. Maybe you're getting your email you know, blasts and here's just different content that you're consuming. If you're consuming theological content without the filter of the word of God on, then it could be very dangerous. You could be led down a wrong path if you're just receiving everything as the gospel truth. Let me just show you what I, I got an email just this last week. I thought that was just, it was just pertinent to our study. I got an email that said this. I just transcribed it here for you. They said, hey, Jason, wow, Wednesday night with Pedro was amazing. There was a, like a Zoom podcast thing they were doing. Here's an example of something he shared. Here's the quote. The prosperity of the gospel glorifies the king. And here's the, here's the line that I had a little bit of a problem with. I had a check in my spirit. Poverty and lack are not of God. Poverty and lack are not of God. Now, I, under, I get that. I get where that comes from, that thought comes from, because I can even, my mind goes to scriptures about the blessing of God, and even God wants us to prosper even as our souls prosper. So I get where they're getting this from, but I have a problem with the blanket statement because what you are saying here, if you say poverty and lack are not from God, then anytime I'm in pain and suffering and lack or in poverty, then it's either punishment from God or an attack of the enemy. And, and that is an erroneous uh, uh, misrepresentation of what we're experiencing. And so what happens is people will mislabel their pain as punishment as opposed to part of God's plan. Or maybe even we could be giving the devil credit for the crisis in our life that God intended for our character development. Come on, are you hearing me, you guys? So, so we got to be careful because this pendulum swing of, of prosperity gospel is dangerous and will lead you down a path of, of misinterpreting the experiences in your life. So let me give you some theology. I'm just going to pause and give you three reasons in the Bible, three, in, three reasons why God would allow illness in our life, why God would allow poverty, lack, suffering, that we see all throughout the scripture that God uses and allows those things. Why does he do it? Three reasons, not in your note. Here's the first one. God uses illness or allows illness in our life, not uses, he allows illness in our life to get our attention and redirect us. See, sometimes God has to put you flat on your back for you to start looking up. Okay, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Sometimes he just got to put you out, dude, for you to actually slow down, stop, start looking up because it's for your redirection. He's getting your attention. Psalm 119, David says, it was good for me to be afflicted. What? That's sick, bro. Like it was, you liked that? No, 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 here's, here's the reason though. So that I might learn something. See, it was good that God had to, he did, he did something in my, he caused some affliction because I needed to learn a lesson. There was something I need to learn. I'm thankful, God, that you stopped and you put me on my back for a moment because I needed to learn. Here's, here's our Proverbs chapter 20 says it. He says, sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. Come on, anyone want to testify about that one right there? I mean, we could go all day talking about the, the stories of this one here that, man, we didn't change because, no, it was when the heat was turned up, when the pain we experienced, and we said, oh, this ain't working no more. This ain't working. So sometimes God, he, he'll allow that to get our attention or redirect us, uh, redirect us. If you want the theological term for this, for those of you that are, that are note-taker studiers, the theological term for this is... Um, is suffering unto discipline, so, or, or sometimes called suffering unto training. The old King James Version, like years ago, we called it the suffering unto chastisement. There is a type of suffering that is a chastisement of the Lord. It's a discipline or a training that God wants to actually get our attention or redirect us. That's one of the reasons we see throughout the scripture. Here's the second reason that we see God will allow suffering, pain, or illness, and that is so that we could be a testimony to others. 
So he knows that he can trust you with, with an illness so that you would be an example to others. That while you are suffering and being afflicted, you are a witness to other people. Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. Paul says, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me and what happened to him, which he was in prison while he wrote this letter. He was in prison. He was beaten. He was in a dark, damp, cold, disgusting dungeon cell is where he was at. And he's like, hey, guys, I want you to know what has happened to me, why I'm being inflicted, why I'm in these chains of suffering has actually helped spread the good news that God allowed these things to happen in my life so I could be a witness and an example to the good news of Jesus Christ. And after serving God for two decades, for over 20 years, I promise you this, I've learned and probably any saint in here that served God for any amount of time can tell you that the greatest witness of your life to unbelievers is how you handle pain the greatest witness that you have, the greatest example and testimony that you have on this earth is how you handle that suffering experience, that painful experience. See, sometimes God's saying, no, I'm trusting you with this because the way that you carry this is gonna be an example to others. It's a testimony for others. And the theological term for this is called a sickness to the glory of God. There is, there is a sickness unto discipline. There is a sickness unto glory where, where it's actually to give glory to God. Jesus talks about this in John chapter 11, verse four about Lazarus when Lazarus passed away or was sick, actually. He says, this sickness will not end in death. It's an illness for the glory of God to bring glory to the son of God. So did you know God will actually allow some things to happen, some illnesses to bring glory to himself. Now listen, if you're complaining and crying and criticizing, God ain't getting no glory from that. It's only when you persevere and have patience when you are under pressure and pain that God gets the glory from it. So there's a sickness for discipline and training. There's a sickness to bring glory to God, but sometimes God allows the sickness, thirdly, to take us into eternity. See, if you could just name it and claim it and speak whatever you want and have whatever you want and get all the healing you want on this earth, you'd never die. You just never, but the Bible actually tells us this in Hebrews chapter nine, it is the plan that you die. It is God's plan that you would die once, not twice. He wants you to die once. That's it. That's God. So it's actually God's plan that one day it's going to end. It's going to, and this is called, the, the theological term for this is called a sickness unto death. There is a sickness unto discipline, a sickness unto glory, and a sickness unto death. These are all three types of, of sicknesses that God allows for a specific purpose. With Lazarus, he said, this is not a sickness that leads unto death. This is a sickness that leads unto Glory, but there is a sickness, a time in our life where God will call us home. So what do we do? We're supposed to pray and believe and obey and leave the outcome to God because both sides, both sides of this is a miracle. What are both sides? Second Timothy chapter four, verse 18. Now, picking back up in your notes, he says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack. Can I get an amen right there? That's some good news. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. When I, when I first read this, I said, well, which one is it, God? Are you gonna rescue me from the evil attack? Or are you gonna bring me into your kingdom? Which one is it? And you know what the answer is? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> God, God's going to do both. There's, whether, whether it is going to be a miracle in your life, an answered prayer that you lifted up to God, you ask for something impossible, immovable, uncontrollable, and breakthrough happens, and the doctors say, I don't understand. That's a miracle of God. Either that or God brings you safely into his heavenly kingdom. It's a miracle. They're both miracles of God. Both of them are. One miracle is no different from the other. Maybe in our eyes it is, but not to God's. So James, he changes the subject, it seems, 
when he says, oh, and by the way, if he sins, he'll be forgiven too. And if you confess your sin and pray for each other, that's, that's real healing. That's deeper than physical healing. So the, the second observation I see in this text is this, is that God is actually more concerned about my soul. God is not as concerned about the temporary things that keep you up at night. He's not as concerned about the temporary earth things that you and I are, even like the body things, like things that we pray about, about our body. And we, I think we're very body focused in this world, rightly so, kind of, right? I mean, you should focus, put on your seatbelt. A lot of them put on your seatbelt. If you don't, you probably should, okay? You take care of your body. You try to eat right. Some of you, you know, get the tummy tucks and all this crap. You put so much attention on your body and like I'm for some of that stuff, but I think like we're too body focused. We're too body focused. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, not in your notes, but Jesus said that you should not be afraid of the one who can kill the body. Don't be so body focused. He said, you should be more afraid of the one who can kill your soul and throw it into hell fire. Like we should, you shouldn't be so concerned about your body and the things of this earth. You're missing the point if you think it's all about being healed in your physical body. You want a real miracle? James says, you know what a real miracle is? When a man is forgiven, when their soul is cleansed, that's the real miracle. Luke chapter 10, verse 19 and 20, Jesus says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. And those are like pictures of, of demonic power. Those are symbols of demonic power. And to overcome all the power of the enemy. Look what he says, nothing will harm you. We love that verse, huh? Woo, woo, oh yeah, I claim that one. Okay, hold on, let's go to the next verse, okay? Because Jesus says in the very next verse, he says, however, do not rejoice. Hold on, don't, don't get all excited that the spirits submit to you. That's not anything to get so excited about. Here's what's really worth some praise, that your names are written in heaven. That your names are written in the Lamb's. Jesus said, hold on, man. It's not really about that stuff. What's really more important is that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Praise God for that. Amen? Here's the last thing that I see in the text because he keeps stirring us toward prayer and faith and prayer and faith. And that is, he says, God wants me to grow in my faith. God wants me to grow in in my faith, it's a major theme of this text. God wants me to grow. He wants me to, to go on a faith journey. And he uses a character that we're going to study in this section of the book. He, he, it's the faith to believe for miracles on earth. The faith to believe that there's a heaven. The faith to believe everything in between, between here and heaven. To have the faith to believe God that he's working things out. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 actually says that without faith, and faith, by the way, is the substance of things hoped for. And the evidence of things not seen, the Bible says. So not only does God want you to pray for it, he wants you to believe him for it, that he's actually going to move and work on your behalf. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe, must believe he's working, that he exists, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So then the, the, let's pick up the text in verse 17. James then goes to a, a, a Bible character and a story of the Old Testament in order to try to get us to pray differently, in order to get us to believe differently, to lift our faith and like live different. He gives us this amazing example in James chapter five, verse 17. He says, Elijah, check this out. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. You ever compare yourself to Elijah? Anyone in here? Anyone in here? Not, not a lot of us. Elijah's like the main dude, right? He's the miracle working prophet of God. He's actually like... Second to Moses, probably tied with Moses, the biggest Old Testament character, the most esteemed in Jewish history next to Moses is Elijah. I mean, so here's how, listen, this is what James is doing. James, again, he's writing to a scattered church. He's writing to like, like believers who are persecuted and all over the place. And he's saying, hey guys, I want you to believe different. I want you to, to pray different. And some of, because some of you are thinking like, yeah, that works for them, but it doesn't work for me. See, that would work for you, Pastor. That works for Elijah. I mean, he can pray for miracles and stuff like that and healing and, and, and maybe for some people like you, but that's, that's, I don't know it can, it can work for me. And here's what James is saying to the church, to every single one of you. Elijah was just a man, just like you. There wasn't anything special about the man, 
but the God that consumed the man. Elijah was just a human being. Like you can, you can pray like this, church. He's trying to lift us. You can pray like this. You can believe like this. Is any one of you in trouble? Believe God, man. Pray for it. Is it going good? Praise God for it. Like you can, he was just a man, even as we are. And this is what he did. He prayed earnestly. He gives a story now that we're going to study. We're going to study this story. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. And then he says, and then he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced crops after three and a half years. Well, that's not really how this, that was like a very condensed version James gives us of how that story actually went. It's found in 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to study it because it wasn't that easy. It wasn't like Elijah was like, I pray and it stops. Three and a half years later, I pray and it, and it happens again. It wasn't, it didn't go like that. In fact, it actually goes how you're in my life look. It goes more like, like our life. It's not as easy. There's actually a process and the process is the point that God is, is taking every single one of us. He wants to take you on a faith journey. He wants to take you in a place where you're praying different, you're believing different, and James is using this example. So let's study it. I studied this a few months ago in preparation for part nine, this actual installment of the series. And 1 Kings chapter 17 is where we find this story where Elijah actually, you know, stops reigning for three and a half years. He's actually talking to the king here. It says, now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, They'll, there will neither be dew or rain in the next few years except at my what? Except at my word, he says. So Elijah did, he, he didn't say, it, the rain didn't stop because he said so. The rain stopped because he had a word. He had a word inside of him from God that he acted upon, that he believed, and therefore there was no Rain. So I'm here to tell you guys, that's how faith works. Here's the first thing. If you want to, the, the first step of the faith journey that James says, this is how it works. Pray different, believe different, do it like Elijah, because he's just a man. The first step is this. Faith begins with a word from God. So, listen, you need a word from God. Now look, where do you get a word from God? From the word of God. Where do you, where do you get a word? I get a word from the word, if you want your faith to grow, you're going to need to get a word and you get a word from God, from the word of God. Can I ask you a direct question? Listen to me. Are you reading your Bible? Are you reading your word? Because listen, if you're not reading your word, then you're not going to have any faith. And this is, this is one of the reasons why we're studying James in the first place after the crazy year and a half that all of us have experienced because what the quarantine did and COVID did is actually ripped your spoon-fed version of the gospel out and some of you started deteriorating in your faith because you don't have your own word, you take my word. You don't have your own word, you have Stephen Furtick's word on YouTube. You don't have your own word. You got, you got a Devo. You're, you don't have your own word. And I love like, please come and hear the word. This is part of it. This is part of your journey, but it is not the word that God wants to give you. You need a word from God. Like for yourself, you need a word. In order, in order to get that word, you got to know the word. Look, this is the faith journey that, that starts, that can produce something that is supernatural, that James is saying, he's just a man. He was a man with a word. Come on, somebody, you need a word. You need a word from God. You need to get into the word and wrestle with that thing until God gives you. Now, if, if you don't want it, it's, if you don't get a word, it's all up to you. Like, it's only your effort. But if you don't want your effort and what you can produce, then you need to, you need to pray. And in order to, to pray, you need to have faith. In order to have faith, you need to get a word. In order to get a word, you need to get into the word. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what are you hearing that's producing what you're believing? See, because fear comes by hearing, hearing a word not, not in line with the word of God. So if you got fear in your life and anxiety in your life, it's because you are hearing a word that does not agree with the word. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing 
by the word of God. When I get in situations that are difficult, that are challenging, because I do, I get in situations and problems and circumstances, just like every one of you. But one thing I do when I get in that situation, I go to the word. I go to get a word from God because I can't do this alone. I don't want to do it alone. I need something to declare, man. I need something to hold on to. I need a promise of your scripture, of your word, God, that I can hold on to, that can be deposited in me when I'm worried about my kids. When I'm, when I'm worried, like, like they're going back to school and one's in high school now and one's, you know, first year in high school. I got another first year in junior high coming back, telling me what they're hearing, what they're exposed to, what they're talking to them about. And I'm like, oh God, help them, Lord. And, and what if this happens? And oh, what if that happens? And when that happens, I go get a word. Here's the word. Jer Jer Joshua chapter 24 says, but as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. Okay, I understand there's attacks and there's these things going on, but no, God, I'm going to hold on to that word. As for me and my family, my kids are going to serve you. They're going to love you. They're going to grow up and honor you. My kid, and I'm going to hold on to that word. And I go back to that word. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Oh, well, what about the pandemic? There's a new strain and there's this, and I'm afraid. Now, don't get me wrong. Be safe and stuff, but get a word. Don't just take a word from news or Google or, or get yourself a word for every challenge and crisis you're in. Here's a word for you if that's you. Psalm 91. You ought to write this down, verse 2 and 3. This I declare about my God. He alone is my refuge. He alone is my place of safety. He alone is my God. He alone I will trust for he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. Come on, somebody grab that word right now. Grab that word. I'm gonna hold on to that, God. I'm gonna hold on to that word. I'm not gonna be afraid. You are gonna protect me. I look to you alone. Oh, I've lost my job though, and I got, the, I got paid, God, and, or I can't find a job. Get a word. Philippians chapter four, verse 19 says, my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of glory in Christ. I'm going to hold on to that word. I know it's tough. I know it's hard right now. But God, you said you would meet every single one of my needs according to your riches and glory that are not in me, that are not in this world, but the riches and glory that are in Christ Jesus. God, I'm holding on to that word. Amen, somebody? That's my job, to hold on to the word. I got to get a word from God. The word of God is powerful. It is powerful. It's how your faith journey begins. You getting a word from God. The scary thing is, I think that a lot of you have been to church a long time, but you haven't started the faith journey. Because you don't got a word. You need a word. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1, he says this about the God speaking about the power of his. Look at, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, God says. It's not, it, it will accomplish. God says what I desire, not what you desire, but my word, God says, is going to accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You need a word in your life. That's how the faith journey begins. So James is going, look, pray, 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 believe, believe, believe. Look, it's not just for a certain select of people. Elijah was just a man. He just went on a faith journey. That's all he did. He got a word from God. Now let's pick up the story of Elijah. Let's continue to study this. Verse 41, it says, And Elijah said to Ahab, now three and a half years later, he says, Go eat and drink, for I'm getting another word. I'm getting, mm, there is a sound of heavy rain. Now look, this was a bluebird day. There was no, there was no, nothing, the cl clouds, beautiful, birds chirping. The sound he's talking about is, is the sound in his spirit. He got a word from God. No, no, no. Something in me is moving. God, so it's, I hear the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink. But Elijah, he says, climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. See, here's, here's what you need to do when you get a word. Some of you, you're like trying to figure it out still. You're trying to like control it, figure it out why, how, when, and, and fix it and do it. And, 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 and what you need to do is go to a place where you can get along with God. Some of you need, to, you need to do that like today. You need to stop trying to control the situation. You do have a word, but what you need to do with that word is get alone in a place and put your head between your knees and wait upon the Lord. Amen, somebody? And, and you need to get alone. And here's what Elijah is teaching us, that when you get a word from God, you can't go off of your feelings. 
Here's what God, the, the second step of the faith journey, your faith is building. Your faith grows when you don't give up. Your faith grows when you hold on to that word. You see, Jesus said that, that the word of God is a seed that's like scattered on different soils. And here's what some of us do. We get a word and it's planted in our soil, but we don't hold on to it. We don't, we don't, we give up on the soil. We abort the seed before it is able to germinate, produce fruit and breakthrough in our life before it breaks through the soil and produces fruit. You abort the word. You abort the seed. How do you abort it? When you dig it up and you go, where are you at seed? Why aren't you working, huh seed? And you yell at the seed and you yell at it. And what's the matter with you seed? The seed was meant to be buried and broken. It was meant to be buried and broken and held onto so that it would grow. Your faith grows when you hold on and you don't give up. Watch what happens to Elijah. Verse 43. Go and look toward the sea, he tells his servant. Go and look. It's a bluebird day, but go and look. I'm, I'm, I got a word here. And he went up and looked and he came back and he said, there's nothing there. So he said seven times, go back. Okay. Some of your word from God will always begin in the invisible. It'll always begin in the realm that you cannot see. You'll Because you're believing God for something that is not yet. And, and you'll come through circumstances and situations where, where there's nothing. Well, I'm believing you for it. Let's, let's check again. Nothing. Nothing. Seven, seven times. Nothing. 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 And if you're in that situation here today, you're believing for something, you believe for, I don't care if you've been a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, you've been believing for it. Here's the word that God told me to give you today. Go back. Go back. Oh, there's nothing? Go back. Keep believing. Hold on to the word. Let it build. Let it grow. Go back. We'll always, just because you don't see it doesn't mean God isn't working in it. Faith always begins that way. The word that you're holding on to, it begins in the ways that you cannot see. It's deep underneath the soil, you guys. Here's what he says. The seventh time, the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariots and go before the rain stops you. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, he's saying, Although it may look like a little bit, a little is a lot when God's in it. That's all I need. That's all I need is a little cloud. That's all I need is, is that's all I need. And I'm going to believe you, God. Great faith seems like nothing at first. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36, 39. I'm closing it down with you guys. Hold on. He says, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, don't give up. Keep working. Keep believing you'll receive what he's promised. Here's what he said, for in just a little while. Now, I hate to tell you, that's God little, little while, not your little while. He's, he works on a different timetable. <laughs> a year is like a, you know, a thousand years and a thousand years like a day, okay? So for in just a little while, he who is coming will come and he will not delay. It will be just in time. He says this, but my righteous one will live by faith. And God says, I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back, who gives up, who doesn't hold on to that word. But here's what he says. But we here, we don't belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. We're going to persevere. We're going to hold on to this word. We're going to believe it. We're going to find a place to pray and believe and keep holding on to that thing. Here, this verse 45 it continues of this story. He says, meanwhile, the sky, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose and heavy rain came on and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. And the power of the Lord came upon Elijah and tucking his cloak in his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab, who was on a horse and chariots, all the way to Jezreel. So first of all, it's impossible that there would be a monsoon of rain on a bluebird day, but it is impossible that a man can outrun a horse. But when you have faith, it not only grows, but it is intended to build to a point of number three, your faith journey. Look, faith breaks through the natural into the supernatural. This is the faith journey that, that James is saying. Like, this is what you need. Pray and believe. Get a word, 
hold on to that word. There is a process that needs to happen here because what you're holding on to needs to needs to build to a point of breakthrough from what is in the in the spiritual to the natural. That faith, as you believe, there is a breakthrough from the natural to the natural. But Jason, it just can't happen. That's impossible for this to happen. I just it's been too long. I get it. It is impossible. It is with man. With man, it is impossible. Matthew 19 says, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. See, this is the faith journey that isn't just reserved for some pastors, some people, some Old Testament characters. This is the faith journey. James is writing to the church, man, to believers who are scattered, who don't, don't even attend anywhere right now. And he's going, man, y'all need to pray different, believe different. Elijah wasn't special. He just got a word. And he held on to that word till he got his breakthrough. That's all you need. And then he does this. He continues in a very unique way. James ends in a unique way. He says, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. This is how James ends the entire book. And here's what he's saying. Look, I He's saying, look, I hope it all works out for you. I hope you, I hope the outcome you're looking for on earth works out. I hope you get the supernatural power and breakthrough right here. But even if you don't, that's not what's most important. What's most important, write it down, is your eternal life. That's what's most important, is that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Can I pray that over you? Come on, let's bow our heads and close our eyes all over this place. Some of you are here today. And, and you know, like this was just in time for you because you've been ready to give up on something, to give up on what God told you, on the word that you have, the revelation that you have. The, you're ready to maybe throw in the towel on something that God says, hold on, don't give up. Hold on, don't give up. There's a breakthrough coming if you hold on to that word. Let it grow, let it build. Go back, go back, go back. Keep going back. As a, hold on to that thing until your breakthrough comes because God is not, he's not running late. He's always on time. He's not in delay. 